Okay, good evening. Disaster recovery. Like, how appropriate. Three computers before we were able to actually make it work. But we made it. The bad part is that I have to present like this with a, an arm to, you know, advance slides. But it's going to be okay. So, I think reInvent has been so far an amazing event. This is the last session uh, of today's event. And uh, we are talking about backup and disaster recovery. The reason why you're here, I think, is because you want to know more about how to do those things in the cloud. And you also want to understand what are the uh, important elements to consider or the lessons you can take from possibly uh, previous events or previous uh, situations where people had to deal with backups and disaster recovery. My name is uh, Simone Brunozzi. As you can guess, it's a strange name. It's an Italian name. Most of the time when I walk on stage, people look at me and say, we were expecting a beautiful French lady. And instead they see an Italian guy. So I know this is disappointing to some people, but don't worry, I'll try to make it up for it. So I think that uh, presentations shouldn't be just uh, a way to feed information to people. I think it's mostly about trying to inspire you together with providing information. So we're going to be technical, but I decided since this is the last session of the day, you should be tired. You should be very eager to go out and party in Vegas. So a good reason for you to stay here might be to uh, hear about two stories. I will use those two stories. One, it's about a bombing of a monastery. The other one is about an earthquake in Italy. And I will use those two stories to drag uh, lessons related to backup and disaster recovery. And at the end, hopefully that one will work, there will be a little surprise for you. So first one, a prologue, an introduction. This is planet Earth. If you were here 10 minutes ago, you see this, when we were desperately trying to make laptops work. This is Italy. If you zoom in in a place between uh, Rome and Naples, there is a, a building called the Abbey or the Monastery of Monte Cassino. This is how it looks like from, uh, from a satellite image. Why is uh, Monte Cassino, this is a picture of today's uh, building, so important for us? Well, we could ask Nicolas Cage, which uh, goes in search of treasures, at least on movies. And in fact, Monte Cassino, a while ago, had a huge amount of uh, treasures in the form of books, uh, papal documents, paintings, uh, incunabula. If you don't know what an incunabula is, it's a book printed before 1501, uh, current era. Uh, Gutenberg's Bible has been printed in uh, 1455, so you can guess it's a pretty important one. And uh, Titian paintings. Titian is one of the most influential Renaissance paint, uh, painters in the world. And in fact, uh, there is a Titian room here in this hotel at the Venetian. So if you look at the business continuity continuum, there are three aspects that we always consider when then we want to talk about backup and disaster recovery. The first one, of course, is high availability. But then following that, we need to know how do, how do we do backup, how we, storage, uh, how we store our backups, and how, how we do a disaster recovery in case something happens. And I'm sure that you're all pretty technical here. You know that high availability is all about being up and running. Backing up is the process of copying and archiving of data so I can retrieve this data in case of a failure or disaster. And disaster recovery is what I should do in order to recover my infrastructure, my service, my platform after a, a natural or human-induced disaster. If you look at a monastery, like the Monte Cassino, a monastery is a brilliant, scalable, low-cost, very highly durable uh, way to store books, of course. Uh, and in fact, it's at the origin of universities. Charlemagne, in 814, uh, uh, edicted, uh, so created a document uh, by asking the church to provide people that were indoctrinated, that were cultured enough, so they could manage his empire. And uh, after this, a few centuries later, from monasteries, the first universities came to life. And the first one was in Bologna. And Bologna will be important in a few minutes. Indoctrination, which is a function of the Catholic Church and of other churches around the world, is a critical function, which of course need, needs continuation after a natural or human-induced disaster. Those two things should sound familiar to you. In fact, those two aspects might be considered the origin of modern backup 
and disaster recovery. So, but again, why is Monte Cassino so important? If we go back to World War II in 1943, uh, it happened that uh, Italy was in a messy situation and people in Rome, from different parts of Rome, museums and other places, decided to gather their arts, their treasure, and send everything to Monte Cassino for safety. So they shipped all those goods to Monte Cassino uh, for, for, of course, uh, for the duration of the war. But then it happened that uh, in Monte Cassino, uh, which was considered a safe harbor for those uh, art pieces, uh, the Germans were nearby, the Allies were trying to advance, and a message was intercepted. This message was uh, misinterpreted. Is der Abt noch im Kloster? Abt might mean military division, abbreviated, or abbot, which is natural to have an abbot in, a, in an abbey, of course. So because of this message and a few other miscommunications, uh, Monte Cassino was targeted for a huge bombing, uh, which uh, would happen in February for, uh, 1944. But before that, the treasure of Monte Cassino was transported back to Rome because, in particular, because of uh, two people, two uh, German uh, officials, which were in love for art and uh, couldn't afford, couldn't uh, accept the loss of those uh, pieces of art. So there was the escape from Monte Cassino, a huge effort which involved soldiers, priests, friars, volunteers, paid with 20 cigarettes a day and uh, a piece of bread. And after only three days, all those goods were transported to Rome. And this is thanks to particularly to those two people, uh, uh, Julius Schlegel and uh, Maximilian Becker from the German uh, uh, army. Those two people were in love with art, and they decided to save those masterpieces. Then the biggest bombing against a single target of all time ever in the history of mankind happened in Monte Cassino, and this is how Monte Cassino looked like just after the bombing, uh, in the afternoon of the bond, after the bombing. And then, 10 years later, in 1954, they decided to restore Monte Cassino to its original shape, and then this is how it looks like today. So, end of prologue. Now let's try to get some lessons from what happened to Monte Cassino. The first lesson is that my backup should be accessible. I don't want to experience the pain of physical data transfer. Uh, so it means that, for example, if you use Amazon Web Services, you have multiple ways, multiple tools that help you make your backup accessible. You can use APIs to uh, interact with the AWS cloud. You can use Direct Connect, which is a direct connection between your data center and multiple locations around the world. The Storage Gateway, which allows you to uh, backup your volumes and store them on Amazon Web Services and do additional stuff. You own the data, so you decide even when you want to delete your files, and those files will be deleted forever. And of course, you can decide how much redundancy you want. You can also decide to use a physical shipment of data, but in this case, it's much easier because you can put your data in disk drives, give it to a courier, and ship it to Amazon Data Center, or do the vice versa. So if you look at an architecture diagram, this one here, um, it's a very simple diagram. We have uh, the storage gateway, which is the big box you see in the center. And those ones are gateway stored volumes, local volumes. Those are essentially snapshots of running machines that I'm using, my application, my local servers. And then those volumes can be optionally uh, stored to Amazon S3 and, uh, in case restored, as volumes that you can attach to an Amazon EC2 instance after, uh, after you want to turn it on. So if you look at a bigger uh, architecture diagram like this one here, we have uh, essentially three parts. The first one is your local data center where you might have a, an Oracle uh, database, for example, or an Oracle application. You can have an application server. And then you can have the storage gateway with those storage volumes stored also or backed up on Amazon S3 through a secure connection. Then you have a second part, which is your uh, VPC, your virtual private cloud, protected private area of the AWS cloud, in which you can optionally launch and run your Oracle database or another type of database, your application servers, etc. And you can, of course, retrieve snapshots from S3 and launch machines inside VPC. And then you have a third part, which is, of course, where you store those files, the backup part in specific. The blue part there is Amazon Glacier, of course, that you probably already know now. 
If you take a closer look <coughs> at the left part of the diagram, you can see that uh, I can have gateway cached volumes or gateway stored volumes. The cached volumes essentially are the most frequently accessed part of your volumes that reside in your local data center, but you store everything in your uh, external data center or Amazon Web Services. And then, one more click. You can uh, store them in, on Amazon S3 for immediate retrieval if you need to. We can call this cool storage to some approximation. Or you can uh, store them on Amazon uh, uh, Glacier, AWS Glacier, which of course takes a few hours before giving you the first byte of whatever archive you stored in it. But of course, it costs significantly less. And then, of course, last but not least, you can connect your own data center to the AWS cloud in three ways, in multiple ways, but through a VPN tunnel, encrypted and secure. You can use uh, the public internet or the AWS Direct Connect, or you can use uh, AWS Import Export. So you have multiple ways to transfer data in and out, so you to make essentially your data accessible. The second lesson is that my backup should be able to scale it was almost impossible to scale the uh, escape from Monte Cassino operation because they were, you know, uh, luckily for them, they were able to get a lot of volunteers and pay them with cigarettes and uh, bread. But other than that, it's usually not this easy to scale your infrastructure. And on Amazon Web Services, you have essentially an infinite scale, scale with uh, Amazon S3, with Amazon Glacier. You can scale even to multiple regions if you want. It's seamless. You don't need to uh, decide in advance, but you can just scale up your, the amount of storage you're using on the fly, so there is no provision. And of course, we offer cost tiers, so we save you money when you go uh, to a bigger scale. We also have a global infrastructure. You've seen this already multiple times by now. So multiple regions, multiple availability zones in each region, and then we have multiple edge locations for CloudFront and for Route 53, the uh, DNS service that we provide. The third lesson is that my backup should be safe. Luckily, talking about the disaster recovery earlier, my little surprise has just arrived. I'm gonna tell you about it in a minute. So this thing didn't fail, luckily. And my, back sh my backup should be safe. What I mean by this? Well, you can use the SSL endpoints to transfer your data to Amazon Web Services or to retrieve it. Of course, uh, you can use signed API calls for any comment you uh, send to Amazon Web Services. Uh, you can decide to encrypt files and then send them to Amazon Web Services so they are already encrypted when you send them to AWS. And of course, without the key, we cannot uh, open them. You can also use server-side encryption. As soon as you send your data to Amazon S3, we encrypt it using your uh, keeper, your credentials, and then we store them. And of course, you can decide how much durability you want. For example, Amazon S3 offers normal uh, standard uh, storage option and reduced redundancy option, which is less durability for a lower price. And of course, you can mix and match the local storage with the cloud storage, especially if you use the storage gateway. For example, in this case, it's a simple diagram. You have Amazon S3, you have Glacier, and essentially you can see that I can use the redu reduced redundancy option or the standard redundancy option. In uh, the first case, I will have less copies of my files around. My backup should also work with a DR policy. I don't want to wait 10 years before my infrastructure gets rebuilt again like it happened for Monte Cassino. So uh, whatever uh, backup I build, I should be sure that it's integrated with my disaster recovery policy. It's easy to do it with AWS or in a hybrid environment. And of course, for example, the AWS Storage Gateway in particular allows you to uh, run services on Amazon Web Services, in particular to Amazon EC2, which means that if you store your volumes in the storage gateway, then you need to do a disaster recovery. You can launch EC2 machines, use those volumes to essentially get your service back to life. It means that your disaster recovery is integrated with your backup strategy very easily. And of course, um, you should also make sure that you reduce the cost of having a disaster recovery plan in conjunction with a backup plan. So if you look at this uh, simple diagram here, if my application server fails, I can easily uh, do something, take the uh, volume, create a new EC2 instance, launch it, and then 
map this new machine to my own local uh, infrastructure and make it act as if it was my previous machine so I can restore the service pretty easily. Someone should care about it. This is the last but perhaps most important lesson. In the case of Monte Cassino, there were two people in love with art and uh, literature and books and paintings. In your case, someone should be clearly, let's say, in love or in charge of your backups and your data. And you can also define clear ownership also by using the tools that we give you, such as IAM, Identity and Access Management. And of course, good suggestion, always log everything. Many people actually here at this conference at different tracks uh, told this already. Log as much as you can, then maybe you will use those logs, maybe not, but at least it's a good option to log in any case. And then, of course, you can also use the AWS support as a way to make sure that uh, you care, but then somebody else is also helping you in case you have a situation, an emergency situation that you want to manage. So those are the five lessons that we took from the Monte Cassino story. And uh, before we go to the second part of, uh, of our uh, talk, I'm going to introduce a customer. So we're going to share a customer story with you. And let me welcome on stage Augusto Rosa, Manager, Server Operations with uh, Show Media. Augusto, please welcome on stage. A round of applause. Come on. You have to be here. Yeah, Hi guys, here. thank you so much. Uh, I'm Augusto Rosa, I'm manager of server operations at Shaw Media. And we are um, home to many of Canada's uh, loved uh, brands. Uh, Shaw Media is a division of Shaw Communications. We reach almost 100% of Canadians. We have over the air channels and about 18 specialty channels. Uh, we have uh, over a million viewers on a weekday, access to full episodes like Glee uh, in, the Can in Canada. Uh, we engage about over 25 million uh, Canadians per week. Before AWS, we had a, a mess of several data centers in different places, frequent outages, downtime, expensive hosting fees, and a technology that was just too old and in total disarray. We need to start from scratch. We essentially were given a mission impossible. We had, our mission was to implement a new CMS, empower our editorial team, um, meet business objectives that included, uh, do all this migration in just nine months, and be agile and very cost effective at the same time. Uh, we actually didn't take too long on this decision. We chose Amazon Web Services. You know, Amazon has a, quite a lot of services, and we actually use quite a, a, a lot of them, as you see. And we continue to evaluate them almost on a monthly basis and uh, to see what fits our needs as we grow. Our business is very agile, so we, we really do change quite, a, quite frequently. In our phase one of the Amazon Web Services, we really took advantage of fast deployments of servers, network rules, load balancers. Our first, to describe how quick we did this, our first site went live in just four weeks in production. That included development and infrastructure. We, at the end of it, did a migration of 29 uh, websites from a physical data center in just about nine months. All our public TV stations, websites. Phase two of our project, uh, a few months later, we did another migration of six other sites and web services APIs from a second physical location in just about two months. Uh, we migrated from uh, old Windows 2003 SQL 2008 to uh, Windows 2008 SQL 2008. We actually created the entire infrastructure web farm in one to five days. Uh, last time I did this, it took months on a physical data center. Um, it took us longer to procure licenses than to get the infrastructure done. Uh, we use uh, the ability to scale and automate was uh, big for us in this phase. Um, we increased our uptime right away to 99.99%. 99 
uh, we can scale to success, we have much quicker response to our business needs. We saved over millions of dollars in capital and operational costs. Uh, we don't have so much of a physical inv investment, we have much smaller teams. We even went as further to start using service management companies uh, that help us support the infrastructure. Another big win was the backups are so easy at AWS that we got uh, now tax credits from the government as we retained those backups for over three years. This is just a, a sample of our infrastructure and it, it, it kind of goes against a lot of the stuff who spoken at the conference here. We layered everything into its own security group, take security serious. Um, if it's a port that needs to be open, oftentimes we'll just split into its own security group. And we, we are a Microsoft.net shop, so we use often most of the technologies big corporations use. And you see everything is structured in a, in, in a, its own security group in a secure fashion. Some of our numbers. Uh, we have over 50 EC2 instances of various sizes, uh, 25 terabytes of traffic a month, 40 million route 53 queries, um, over 10 terabytes of backups on S3, and it continues to grow. Uh, I think important to us in, as we embarked on this two years ago was what lessons did we learn? And I think a uh, uh, main one is architect for AWS in mind, uh, make use of all availability zones. Uh, make on the area you choose, divide across them. That's very important. Uh, I think you should plan for failures, expect failures, be crazy about those failures. They just happen, things fail. Back up, back up, back up. I'll show you later what that means. Uh, we, uh, an example is on a monthly basis, we will take an AMI of every single of our servers. It's just an ongoing thing. Uh, Windows sometimes can be a challenge on, on the cloud, but uh, things do work, and we've been working with it for two years. Sometimes you have to implement workarounds. Um, and one last thing is that you should really engage Amazon architects to help you out, because they have best practices, they have, uh, they've gone through this and helped many customers. On the topic of disaster recovery, I think a very key, key thing to this is that you should learn from your outages all time. Uh, implement changes that prevent those things from happening again. You should document your procedures so everybody in the team knows. Uh, my, our motto at Shaw is single components fail, architecture shouldn't, and I think Amazon just makes it very, very easy for you to accomplish that. This is just some of what we do for backups. Uh, it's quite comprehensive. We use automated daily snapshots of all our volumes automatically. Some very important volumes will take snapshots every four hours. We keep the last 10 snapshots. Sometimes we keep longer. Uh, we, at the, at the other side is that we have our show backup software, Dell Replay, and we backup file systems every hour in certain servers. Uh, we backup and then those volumes that are get backed up by the, the software get replicated to another Amazon uh, total zone uh, on Oregon on the West every two hours. So our SQL Server backups every 30 minutes, um, those backups get moved again every two hours to a total different region, uh, east to west. So this is, as you see, we have multiple ways to get the data back. We test this on a very frequent basis. We actually use them quite frequently. Uh, our future to us is uh, moving to, uh, from the public cloud that we started two years ago to VPC. We're starting using more auto scaling for our web farms, using more of Amazon S3 for our images. Um, we're also starting to use some services, for example, Elastic Cache as a central caching for our ASP.NET apps. And that's my story. I hope uh, you learned something from it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be around after. Okay.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Augusto. Thanks. So I can bet on something. You never saw a speaker walk on stage with a piece of Parmigiano like this. Yeah? That's true. So this is the little surprise, and I'll tell you why we're talking about this. But first, let me give you to Christina, which will cut it for us. And then at the end of the talk, you're going to stay and then enjoy the Parmigiano with us. So we're going to talk about the uh, 2012 Emilia earthquake. So in, uh, on May 20th, 2012, a big uh, earthquake struck Italy, uh, specifically in a region called Emilia-Romagna. The epicenter was very close to Bologna, where accidentally the first university was born when we were talking about universities and monasteries. And um, as a result, as you know, most uh, uh, Parmigiano-Reggiano companies are actually in that region, and they were deeply affected by this earthquake. They actually had damaged Parmigiano-Reggiano for uh, a, a value worth more than half a billion euros, which is about uh, $600 million. What happened is that those people are very resourceful. They decided to do something about it. And then they built, uh, they did many things. One of these was to create this website to coordinate efforts, as well as help those factories, those companies, to do something about this Parmigiano Reggiano, which was still good to eat, but it was in a very bad shape, so unpresentable. And it would be ruined very soon if they weren't able to do anything about it. And actually, facciamo means uh, do it in Italian. And uh, they decided to sell this Parmigiano. So this Parmigiano went up for just one euro per kilogram as a discounted price. A lot of people decided to buy it also to support those companies that have been deeply affected with the earthquake. They also sold those Parmigiano Reggiano in uh, discotheques. This is a picture from Naples. So this is pretty interesting. You are in a discotheque, and I'm sure you never saw a Parmigiano Reggiano in a discotheque either. So what type of lessons can we learn from this earthquake? We're going to learn four lessons here, and I'm going to go through them one by one, and then after this, we are essentially finished. So we're going to finish actually a few minutes early so you can go and party in Vegas, okay? So the first lesson is that you need a disaster recovery in place. You cannot wait until the disaster happens to say, ah, oh, what should I do now? You should ask your, yourself that question before anything like this happens. So in the cloud, for example, you want to have a disaster recovery, you can actually do it in multiple ways. You can build a, a high availability disaster recovery like this. Uh, let's say you have a public facing service. It could be websites. It could be a service you're offering to your uh, customers or a business to business type of service. Let's say your end user is there. The end user goes to the load balancer and the load balancer automatically spreads traffic across two or even more availability zones, and then you synchronize those machines together. This is pretty straightforward, but as a consequence, of course, you have twice as much data or backup, which means you have a disaster recovery uh, policy in place in the sense that if uh, one zone goes down for any reason or it's unreachable or there is a hardware failure, whatever happens, the second zone is still up and running and the traffic will be automatically redirected to the uh, zone that is still working, which means you have a high availability uh, architecture, which means you have a pretty good disaster recovery in place. Or you can say, I want to save some money. I don't want to spend twice as much for the infrastructure that I normally need, or I just don't want to spread across multiple availability zones with active services that way because I don't want to manage synchronization and those kind of things. So maybe you want to have an app with a, a, an application disaster recovery with a standby configuration. In this case, you have the end user. It goes directly to just one availability zone with a machine and uh, snapshots of that machine. And you can use an elastic IP, which is a public IP that you can borrow from Amazon. And then you can even map a, a DNS uh, or a website to that elastic IP. So someone will go to www.whateveryoursiteis.com and go there. And then if the single machine fails, you can always launch a second one, uh, taking, for example, the latest snapshot. Or if the entire availability zone has issues, you can always launch another machine which was in standby and was silently synchronizing data or maybe synchronizing it every hour, every 30 minutes. 
and then redirect the elastic IP to the new machine that is now serving customers. So this is a standby architecture which costs less. It's simpler to implement, but of course, you will lose part of your latest uh, changes because if your latest backup was 40 minutes ago and the machine crashes, you lose the last 40 minutes of whatever activity you did on that website, on that uh, server. Which brings us to the concept of business impact analysis and the two infamous or famous uh, keywords or acronyms, RTO and RPO. You all know what they are. RTO is recovery time objective. You essentially have to specify what's the acceptable time for those four steps. How much time can I allow for trying to fix the problem? Then if I realize the problem is not going to be fixed, how much time should I, uh, can I afford to recover the service? How much time do I have to test the solution that I put in place? And then how much time do I have to tell users what are the acceptable times? And based on those, these are usually business requirements. Your CEO might say, my website can be down for at most one hour, but my financial transactions could be down for at most one second. And I don't want to lose data, by the way, so it should be replicated. So you might have different RTOs for different parts of your business. And RPO is essentially how much data you can afford to lose. As if we go back to that example, let's say your last backup is 40 minutes ago, and you do a backup every hour, your RPO is essentially uh, one hour and a few minutes. You always have to get, give some, uh, some extra minutes or some extra time to justify the you know, data transfer or the time for a backup, etc. So those two values are the ones that you uh, decide first for maybe different parts of your business that will be different. And then you implement the architecture that allows you to, to get those. So you can use different types of architecture, a DR architecture. The easiest is backup and restore if there is something that goes wrong. Uh, a slightly different one is the pilot light architecture for quick recovery. You might call it cold standby. So you have something like a machine that is uh, idle. Uh, let's say in AWS terms, an EC2 machine can be uh, stopped. So the machine is there, the data is there. You can easily start the machine in a few seconds. You don't need to boot it, but you can immediately start. And that's kind of a cold standby. You can actually consider the stop and start for an EC2 machine pretty much like a hibernation. And then you can have the warm standby. A machine is running, is there. It's ready to take over if anything happens. This is the situation of Amazon RDS, the relational database service. When you decide to have a multi-AZ deployment, multiple availability zone deployment, you have a hot standby or a warm standby machine that is ready to take over if the first one fails for any reason. And then you can have a much more complex solution using multiple sites, using on-premises and cloud infrastructure, multiple regions, etc. You can go uh, you know, to the level of complexity that you want. But then you have to consider those things because it depends how much you pay for those things. And it depends if you are using the right type of storage for whatever you want to accomplish. So different types of storage. Actually, as you know, Amazon S3, now the price has been reduced. So it's uh, lower than this. But you can see that you have cost, you have a specific performance, and you have durability. And just to explain a couple of points, uh, Glacier has uh, uh, just one star for the performance just because to retrieve the first byte, you have to wait a few hours uh, versus the Amazon EBS provision IOPS, which has you know, a great performance. You can get up to 2,000 IOPS, so IO uh, transaction per second, on a single device uh, by provisioning it. So that's a high performance. And of course, it comes uh, at a price. You pay slightly more than a normal EBS volume. And it has less durability than Amazon Glacier or Amazon S3 because there is less uh, redundancy of data. So depending on what you want to do, you can pick the type of storage that fits your need. And with a schema like this, with a table like this, you can pretty much get a sense of uh, what's the right tool for the job. Second, you have to test your DR. Uh, in the case of the earthquake, of course, it doesn't make sense for them to test it. Uh, I mean, they cannot simulate earthquakes, but they can simulate in some way what happens if uh, there is something like an earthquake or a flood or something like this. Uh, that's what uh, you know, car makers do with their cars before uh, selling them, putting them on the market, or before uh, updating those cars. So 
it's easy to do dev and test in the cloud. You can just spin up machines, test things, turn them off. You pay only for what you use. And of course, the cost is really minimal. So testing your DR is actually a good practice because, as you probably know, as Murphy's Law says, uh, most of the time when, you, when something bad happens and you say, well, no worries, I have my disaster recovery in place, and then you realize it was tested three years ago, which means when it was created, usually, and then something changed, and nobody cared about updating DDR, uh, uh, the disaster recovery policy. So that's the reason why you have to test it. Actually, I've seen many startups, not just big enterprise companies. In my job, I meet a lot of startups. I go to a lot of conferences. Implementing a scheduled disaster recovery like every six months, every three months sometimes, because they don't want to worry about the possibility of their DR policy being obsolete when they need it. And then, of course, you have to consider data transfer speed. So let me become slightly more technical here. This is a script, and uh, I want to thank my colleague uh, Craig Carl, which is an AWS solutions architect, for providing this script. Uh, it's much better than whatever I was able to do. So this script, let me explain. It looks complicated, but it's actually very simple. It's using a tool called the GNU Parallel to do something very simple. So here, you can list all the uh, objects or the files inside an S3 bucket. Then with this command here, you can get the path to the Amazon uh, uh, object, the S3 object, and of course the local destination of your data transfer. And then here, the GNU parallel, you want to run it with as many threads as possible. This is going to be a multi-thread uh, upload or data transfer. And then here, you essentially send, launch this command, this uh, GNU parallel command, uh, giving two parameters, the S3 object path, and then the local destination path. By doing this simple command, well, simple, let's say. It's simple now because it looks simple on, on the screen, but there are many uh, similar tools like this. You can essentially get uh, a data transfer of uh, 2.4 terabytes down from 48 hours to nine hours, so more than five times faster, just by using a parallel upload for your, for your data transfer. So this is something very important that you have to consider. <clears throat> Third is you want to reduce costs, the cost associated with having your DR, your disaster recovery. You don't want to sell Parmigiano for a very low price because long-term it would hurt your business. In their case, it was the only thing they could do, but uh, you don't want to be in that situation. So how can you reduce costs? Well, first of all, as you know, we reduce costs very often. The last one is the S3 cost reduction that was announced yesterday by Andy Jesse. You can opt for reduce redundancy on Amazon S3 instead of standard redundancy. Very useful if you already have a copy of your files somewhere else, then you have some extra redundancy maybe in-house. You can uh, consider using the reduce redundancy on Amazon S3. What is your retention policy? How long should you keep your backups? Uh, in the case of Augusto, they want to keep the last 10 snapshots. Is that the right amount? You want to keep five, you want to keep 20, or maybe you want to do diff, uh, uh, so differentials between different uh, uh, snapshots? You can decide and, of course, affect costs. And then understand the different levels of your backups. Uh, some data should be easily available immediately. Some data can be archived in Glacier, and there is a whole spectrum of possibility in between those two extremes. And then you can take uh, advantage of the reserved instances or the tiers for our costs. So for example, Amazon S3 has tiers. The more you use Amazon S3, the lower the, the cost gets. And of course, you can use the standard or the reduced redundancy, uh, which of course gives you less durability, but of course, it costs much less. You can also have different uh, disaster recovery solutions if you want to, like uh, multiple stairs, like escape uh, stairs like these ones in, a, in this building in Barcelona. Uh, of course, it's easy to integrate an existing vendor with AWS. In fact, very often I see that companies already have some sort of DR in place, and then they realize that it's probably obsolete, it's maybe not working as well as it should, and they consider using AWS as a second vendor, essentially, as a second option for their DR. And then, of course, uh, after this approach, you can uh, you know, have multiple vendors. You can have a hybrid approach. You might say, I already invested in my infrastructure. I want to make use of it. 
So there's nothing wrong with using part, part of my infrastructure for my backups uh, or disaster recovery, and then part of it in the cloud. And then, of course, you might also take advantage of multiple regions if you want uh, a geodiversity, maybe because your business requires so. So those are the four lessons that we can uh, take from the earthquake. You need the disaster recovery in place. You want to test your DR. You can reduce costs if you plan for it in advance. And then, of course, you can opt for different uh, solutions or architectures to implement your disaster recovery. So it's the last part now. We're going to draw some conclusions. And I'm uh, nine minutes uh, early than expected. So we've seen that uh, Parmigiano Monastery, love and faith. So uh, faith and love for art helped save the treasures uh, in the monastery of Monte Cassino. Love for their country helped the people in Emilia uh, do something about the crisis of their Parmigiano industry and somehow managed to uh, save their business after all. And from those things, we can learn a few important conclusions besides the lessons that I already told you about. If you think about it, we always start considering backups and disaster recovery in the same way I personally, maybe not you, but I personally think about uh, dentists. As soon as something hurts, I think, oh, I think I need a dentist now. But you never think about it in advance. Well, I do to, somehow, but it's probably not as much as I should, especially when I was a kid. I was terrible at this. So it's pretty much the same reasoning in our brain. It's something related to how we think, actually, how we human behave and we react to things that we might consider very rare. We might even say, it would never happen to us. It happens to somebody else. The earthquake, not to us. The bombing, likely, hopefully, it never happens to anybody. So those two things are very easy to tackle if you do it in advance with a proper plan. And actually, right now, uh, I don't know about you, but in my previous job before Amazon, I was dealing with a physical data center. I was a CTO in Italy. And I know the pain of managing physical infrastructure, cables, disk drives, disk failures, all that stuff. It was essentially tens of hours a week, huge expenses, just to think about those two things. And as a consequence, we didn't have the backup policy or the DR policy that we actually needed to have. It was not good enough. Luckily for us, we were redundant, so we managed to go through a couple of little incidents, but it was still very painful. And it would take us tens of hours a week to manage those things. Now it's incredibly easy. It's actually unfair. I mean, I don't want you to use those services now. No, actually, it's very good because if you think about those services and your needs, you can easily like, take those new glasses, new eyes, and then say, OK, how can I use this uh, Glacier thing, this archive solution? How can I use Amazon S3 maybe with the reduced redundancy option? It costs you know, a very low uh, amount of money to store things there. And it's good that most of those things have some automation in place. For example, Amazon S3. If you upload a file to Amazon S3, you see a file. But behind the scenes, as Alisa Harry, VP for storage, told you this morning, we replicate that file multiple times. More times if it's the standard one, less times if it's the reduced redundancy one. But then, if for any reason one of those file fails, let's say there is a hard disk failure, we detect it, we replicate from another of the, uh, the other copies around, and you don't even see that. You don't even have to worry about it. You don't have to spend time on it. This is the reason why you don't have excuses now to consider backup and disaster recovery for your business. So with that, I want to thank you very much and consider the benefits that you can get. I actually forgot about uh, those last few um, points here. And uh, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to reInvent. Now you can come and enjoy some Parmigiano here. Thank you very much.